Well, good morning, church. Uh, it's great to be with you again today. I, I wasn't expecting to follow that. Uh, that, that, that was pretty extraordinary. Uh, Wendy and I joke, we're both clergy spouses, and so I feel like maybe I should have been singing up there, but that would have created a whole new kind of melody and harmony that you wouldn't have wanted to, to hear. Um, yeah, that's a confession about me. I can't sing. That was a bad joke. That didn't land, in, in a, uh, but, but that's what it is. Uh, I'm going to invite us as we prepare just to continue today. Uh, would you join me just for a moment again as we uh, turn our attention to God by uh, going together to God in prayer? Would you pray with me? Gracious God, that you'd be present, uh, filling this place. Bring forth your Holy Spirit. Uh, flood the atmosphere. Help us to, to be encouraged and strengthened and inspired. Fill us so that we might be measured and found to be always acceptable in thy sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I, I like to start by, by bringing forth scripture, and, and today I have a couple of passages that I want to lead with. And, and the first is, is a passage that comes from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And, and this is what Paul writes to his church, encouraging them, saying them, uh, remember, don't ever forget this. And he tells his church at Ephesus this, to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than anything we can ask for or imagine. His church at Ephesus, he needed to encourage, he needed to bolster, he needed to inspire them. And so he, he told them to remember, don't ever forget that, that by the power of the grace of God given us, by the power of the Holy Spirit moving through us, we are able to accomplish abundantly far more than anything we can ask for or imagine, which means we can do all things, is what he's pushing them to, to endure to overcome, to transform this city in which we're sitting in. Paul encouraged his church that way. He encourages us the same way. Jesus, he encourages his disciples in a similar kind of fashion. Uh, Paul is the one who, who is echoing Jesus, actually, as Jesus encouraged his disciples who were facing a future filled with fear, not so much hope. And, and so they were looking for somebody to lead the way. Jesus encourages them. In John 14, as he's telling them about the way forward, he tells his disciples this same thing. Remember, the one who believes in me uh, will do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these. These two words of encouragement, they're huge. They're, they're extraordinary. They, they should fuel us, inspire us, get us excited to go forward. And, and the one thing I want to ask you this morning is, do you believe those words? Do you believe that we're able to do those things? That we have the ability to, to do greater things or extraordinary things, far surpassing anything we can imagine, which means we don't even know exactly the extent of that kind of power, but, but what Jesus encourages us and what Paul encourages us to do is to, is to do those things. No matter what is uh, lying in front of us, we're called to, to, by the grace given us, to accomplish extraordinary, abundantly uh, amazing, life-giving kinds of things. This is at the heart of our call. These are words that, that push me, but sometimes I need to remember them uh, because I forget them. I don't know if you ever forget them, but sometimes I, I feel unworthy of words like that or a call like that. When I think about like changing the world as, as Jesus pushes us to do, I come up with excuses, like I don't have time for that, I'm, I'm too busy for that. I think about the location I'm sitting in. You know, Kansas City's in the middle of nowhere. How can we change the world from Kansas City when I can't even change my neighborhood? Kansas City's in the middle of nowhere, and some of you are probably thinking, no, it's not. I'm in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> right? And we think, how can we actually do these extraordinary things? What can we do? God, are those promises really true? The call doesn't change. Our propensity to remember it does. If that's the case, you're not alone. If you struggle with this, you're, you're in good company. This has been the case from the beginning of time. You see this thread of reminding, uh, you know, faithful people of this call to change the world all throughout Scripture. One of the things that we read in Joshua is this word of encouragement offered to the children of Israel, seeking to live into the promises before them, even though they had this tough road to face. This is what Joshua cries out. He says, be strong and courageous, and, and don't be frightened, don't be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever it is that you go. Remember, 
God is with you everywhere that you go, so, so keep going, keep, keep doing. This is this word of encouragement, of reminder, don't forget, God is with you. Paul encouraged the church at Rome, similar to Joshua, saying, remember, I am convinced neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor right, nothing can separate you from the love of God. That's what he tells his church. So press on. Don't forget, God is with you. Nothing can separate him from you. The disciples often forgot this. I, I, I'm formed and fit by the experience of the Last Supper. In, in the Last Supper, Jesus, he, he invites everybody to gather together around them. And as he's sitting at that table, as they're breaking bread together, as, as he's, he's foretelling and forecasting his death, he takes bread, he breaks it, he takes uh, wine, he, he pours it, and he tells them, remember me, my love that will not let you go. Don't ever forget, I'm giving you all that I am and all that I have. Remember, what happens 24 hours later? The disciples are, are nowhere to be found after he is persecuted, crucified, dead, buried. The disciples, it took but a day for them to forget entirely. Jesus comes back despite their fear. This is what we read in Matthew 28. He has words for them. Jesus came to them in their fear, and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So, so go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. My favorite part is how he finishes it. And remember, I am always with you, even to the end of the age. And yet, no matter how many times we hear it, no matter how many times we live into it, no matter how many times we, we know that God is with us, that God is powering us and equipping us, uh, enabling us to do these extraordinary things, we, we find ourselves uh, forgetting. This is the perpetual dilemma of our journey of faith, of our walk of discipleship, of our uh, posture as leaders. We, we don't feel worthy of, of that kind of power, of that kind of gift. We don't deserve it. We've done nothing to earn it. And yet God longs uh, to remind us time and time again, remember, don't forget, I am with you, so go, so do, so accomplish these things according to the gifts that I've given you, and just keep running this race that is set before you. This is the word that, that, that Jesus brings to us, and, and as I think about how this applies to me, uh, what, what, I, what I look for, what I, what I long for as a pastor is, is I long for leadership advice. I, I long for, for, for conferences where I can go and I can hear people give me seven highly effective traits of, of a great leader in the life of the church or, or a great pastor, and, and, and yet what I find is that there's no example of anybody who has ever figured out how to be great like Christ is great by taking seven easy steps. I felt pressured yesterday to give you an acronym so that you could copy something down, so you could leave with something practical like focus. And, and that was the best I could come up with because when I think about scriptural leadership, when I think about what it means to be an effective disciple, someone called to go and, and do the things that God does, the only requirement, as far as I can see it, is that you have to be like the wrong person. You, you, you have to be like a misfit, full of, of doubts. You need to be full of questions and insecurities. You need to have this kind of forgetful mind. You need to have literally nothing that qualifies you for the job. And, and, and this seems like a, a pretty a simple kind of idea or understanding, except when I think I read through Scripture, this is what comes out time and time again as a scriptural pathway toward leadership. God calls these people like you, well, maybe not like you, but he calls people like me who are totally ill-equipped. And, and this is the beginning of time, the, 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 the journey or the, the recipe that God has. God calls Moses when Moses was a murderer on the run. I don't think he was the right candidate, the wrong choice for sure for the job. God called Jeremiah, who was just a boy. He appeared before Mary, this young unwed virgin. She was poor lowly, despised, outcast. Jacob was deceitful. Paul spent his life persecuting Christians. David was the runt of the litter who enjoyed playing the liar and tending to sheep. He wasn't this king of kings. He was this small little guy that couldn't slay anything. He was the wrong choice, and the disciples themselves were mediocre fishermen 
who really had no other options except this guy saw them struggling in the water and says, hey, why don't you come and follow me? And, and they're like, well, that sounds good. We didn't have to fill out a resume. God calls the wrong people. God calls misfits. That's the only leadership characteristic. If you think you have it put all together, I think you're the wrong person for the job. Jesus isn't somebody we would ever hire. If his resume came across our desk looking for someone to lead our, 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 our life of discipleship within our church, we'd see his resume and think, he's a carpenter from Nazareth? I don't think so. If he was the headliner on a, on a big speaking uh, engagement, we wouldn't go hear him. What would he have to offer? Jesus was the unexpected wrong candidate for those who are longing for a Messiah, a Lord. They wanted someone to overthrow the powers governing them. They wanted someone who could lead a, a revolution, who could change the world. They wanted somebody strong and powerful. They didn't need this, this holy infant. Even Jesus was the wrong choice, uh, the wrong candidate. This is how God works. He calls misfits, people who forget. And then he constantly shows up and reminds us, I'm with you, so keep going. Uh, trust in me. Do the things that I do, even if they're perceivedly wrong, uh, because I'll make them right. That's been my experience at Resurrection Downtown. Uh, we're the wrong people. We do the wrong things uh, at the wrong time, uh, in the wrong places, and somehow God makes them work. When we set out as this group of nine people, we, we thought about hosting our very first worship service. We landed on uh, a time, 6 p.m. on Sunday nights. That's the wrong time <laughs> to launch a church. Uh, we chose to, to worship in a space that was free of charge. They gave us access to our space seven hours a week. Uh, and, and it was a, a, a space that wasn't equipped for first-time visitors. It wasn't uh, accessible to all people. It, it didn't have functioning bathrooms. It didn't have air conditioning. It didn't have a, a proper heat. It didn't have windows that opened or closed or any sort of cross-ventilation. And we thought, well, this is where we're going to host our first worship service at 6 p.m. on Sunday night. I, I told you what happened when we made that wrong decision. Uh, great things that started happening because we were just simply pressing on, going and doing. People started to show up as we met them and invited them. They, they joined us on this journey. In the first uh, four months uh, leading up to Easter, we had uh, approached 400 in our worship attendance. Uh, at 6 p.m. on Sunday night, Easter Sunday, that when the disciples were already kind of cowering in, in fear, uh, we had 400 people show up to celebrate the resurrection of life. That was like a huge, extraordinary kind of thing. Don't applaud yet, <laughs> uh, because you don't know the rest of the story. Because that, 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 that day in Kansas City, when we had our highest worship attendance ever at 6 p.m. on Sunday night, that was the first time I ever from Michigan experienced my Kansas City summer. It was over 90 degrees that Easter Sunday. When there's no air conditioning, windows that don't open... Uh, uh, no ability to cross-ventilate in, in a hundred-year-old infrastructure that wouldn't accommodate temporary cooling solutions for fear of turning the whole building off. What we experienced was the first taste of a long, arduous, uh, fiery uh, uh, furnace. The average temperature for the next seven uh, uh, months in, in that sanctuary was over 90 degrees. On the chancel in the stage where all of the lights were burning bright, it was over 100 degrees. During that seven-month period of time, we had four people pass out on the pews. And what we got to see slowly but surely were 400 people hemorrhaging, or maybe the better illustration is sweating, uh, down to 130. I want you to feel like the, the, the weight of that. The momentum we felt, the life that we felt. Here's this band of misfits doing all the wrong things at the wrong times in the wrong places. God is blessing us, uh, equipping us, uh, inspiring us, yielding this fruit. And, and we had experienced it in great kinds of ways. And then slowly but surely, it all was going away. The people we invited stopped coming. 
Uh, the people we had been so excited to introduce to, to the grace of Jesus Christ had kind of lost interest. And we found ourselves in this place wondering, you know, maybe, maybe God didn't choose us. Maybe he didn't equip us. You know, maybe we should pack up and go home. You know, we started doubting and questioning and forgetting uh, God's promises. During that period of time, I, I got to meet this guy. Uh, his name was Brian Van. I met Brian Van, uh, lo and behold, at a Starbucks, and, and surprise, surprise, and, and he hadn't been a part of the church ever, and, 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 uh, and, and I invited him, and he was excited. Uh, he was a teacher in his early 30s, and uh, he was excited because we were going to go and, and serve at a, at a neighboring elementary school, and he wanted to come and join me, and, and, so, uh, and so I met him in, in service, and we were serving together, and as we started serving together, uh, I got to know him, and I invited him to, to then join us in worship in the middle of the Kansas City summer, and, and, uh, and and so he showed up on one of those nights that it was particularly hot, and, and he was present with that really, really small congregation in this really, really terrible, you know, place. And, and as he was present there, he was worshiping, and he was singing, and, and he, he was experiencing something that didn't seem to fit his expectation of church. And, and he found himself then that next morning uh, singing in his classroom. He was singing under his breath with his fourth graders as they were taking a test. And Brian, as he was singing under his breath, didn't anticipate that he was singing loud enough for any of his students to hear, but sure enough, one of them did. And that student got up and, and walked up to Mr. Van, and he said, uh, what are you singing, Mr. Van? And Brian looked at his student and said, well, I'm singing some of the songs that I was singing at church last night. And this little boy said, you, you go to church, Mr. Van? And he said, well, well, well yeah, I... I, I did last night, and, <laughs> and, uh, and he goes, well, what was it like? And, and he goes, well, it was really hot. <laughs> and uh, this fourth grader said, well, why is it really hot? And he goes, well, there's no air conditioning in that, in that, in that church. And, and he goes, well, that's not right. It, you should have air conditioning. It's too hot outside for, for, for life without air conditioning. And and then the little boy just went back to his seat and just sat there. And then he came back up to Mr. Van just a few moments later and said, Hey, Mr. Van, can I, can I uh, uh, build you a, a, a fan? And Mr. Van said, Well, I, I guess. What, what, what do you need? He goes, Well, I just need some construction paper. And, uh, and so he said, Well, here, here you go. And he went back and he started cutting out this, this, this little hand fan. And as he cut out this hand fan, he, he drew on it. And then he came back up to Mr. Van with this fan. And he said, Mr. Van, do, do you have a, a popsicle stick? And, uh, and Mr. Van said, well, yeah, I have a popsicle stick. I'm a fourth grade you know, teacher. Gives him a popsicle stick and goes back and he puts the popsicle stick on it. And then he came back up after he, he finished that. And he said, can I have all of our class do the same thing? The whole class uh, assembled hand fans. For Mr. Van. I don't know if he ever would have come back, but now that he had 25 hand fans, <laughs> he, uh, he came back. Uh, the next Sunday, it was really, really hot again, and he, and he walked in with this baggie full of hand fans from his fourth grade class. I got to present those fans to the, to the whole church. What was great is I got to tell the story as I told the story of those hand fans to that congregation, as they were sweating through worship, they realized that God is with us. Still. He hadn't left us or forsaken us, but he was going with us. Even to the end of the age, he would lead us. And because God is who God says he is, he equips us and he breathes life into us and he gives us his spirit so that we can overcome extraordinary things and, and press on. And, and, and what that took for us to experience it was this little fourth grader that nobody had yet to meet except for Mr. Van. What's greater is the next week they came back again, only this time Mr. Van brought back Javon, his friend and fourth grader. And Javon carried with him an envelope to join us. He put it in the offering plate. It was two dimes and three pennies. Everything he had. I can tell you that that kicked off 
our capital campaign that would allow us to move forward from that place. I, I share this story with you largely because what we know is that, that God sees possibilities even when we cannot. And oftentimes those possibilities abounding around us are, are found in these really small, insignificant things, in these people that we understand to be misfits, people that we don't think have anything to offer, that, that are the wrong candidates, the unlikely choice. This is how God chooses to transform the world around us. This is how God equips us and empowers us and pushes us out into the world so that we might simply have the courage to keep doing the things that God does, to press on, to go and make disciples, trusting that God is with us, remembering that he never leaves us. God chooses the low and despised in this world. He chooses the people who are not to reduce to nothing at the people that are. I, I found that God isn't interested in the strong and, and capable, but when it comes to changing the world, he's, he's more interested in anointing infants than adorning superpowers. He opts for slingshots uh, instead of these, 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 these superhuman kinds of, of people. He summons infants, not, not infantry. Is this God is a God of the wrong way and, and not infants. He's grown uh, to lead us on this misfit mission, as I've understood it. And the only requirement is that you believe that you, with all of your imperfections, with all of your excuses, with all of your perceived inadequacies, are the ones that he chooses to lead the way. This is what we see every time we read through the Gospels, that Jesus, he spends time with misfits, with ne'er-do-wells, marginalized, down, downtrodden, the nobodies of society, the misfits of this world. My favorite example of this happens in John 4. Jesus, he's, he's on the run. The Pharisees know that, that he's, he's baptizing more people than John at this point in time, and, and so they don't like this, and so they're pursuing him. And so Jesus is running away, and as he's running away to go back home, he has two ways to go. You know this. He, he can either go the shortcut, which takes him through enemy territory into this place of Samaritan living, or he can go the long way or around to, to take longer to get home. But Jesus, he goes the short way to enter into this land of, of misfits, and while he's there, he decided to engage in this simple, small conversation. John 4 reads, Jesus comes to the Samaritan city called Sychar, near a plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by this well. It was about noon, and this woman comes to draw water, and he says to her, give me a drink. He didn't have time. He didn't have a reason to engage her. She's the wrong person. In fact, she's the enemy. She's the worst kind of wrong person and enemy because she was also there at noon. She was there at noon because she was trying to avoid public disgrace because that's how people understood her, as a disgrace. And yet Jesus is there. And he meets her. And he engages her, he asks her for a drink, and then he goes past that small talk conversation, and he begins to tell her everything about her that she's never told anybody else. And as he tells her her secrets, reveals to her all of her flaws, he continues to engage her, to be with her, to release her to forgive her, to redeem her, to bind her up, to, to allow her to become the best version of the person that God created her to be, that, that he knew her to be. And what's great about this small, simple conversation is it, is it propels this woman to realize there's a future filled with hope for her. It continues as we read, the woman left her water jar and she went back to the city. She said to the people in the city that she came from, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He can't be the Messiah, can he? Upon hearing her witness, upon hearing her testimony, this crazy thing happened. This entire city uh, is, is kind of captured. Their imagination is, is, is peaked, and, and they can't help but actually go and see the very same thing that she just testified to. And so this entire city, based on this small woman's testimony, uh, goes to see this man that she's talking about, and they're transformed as well. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him. But why did they believe in him? 
because of this misfit's testimony, how she said he told me everything I had ever done. You know, witness, it's not some big thing. Changing the world, it isn't some big thing that should paralyze us. It's something really, really, really small, insignificant, something as simple as a misfit conversation with the wrong person at the wrong time in the wrong place has the power by the grace given to us to transform an entire city. Do you believe this? If it can happen to the woman at Sychar, surely this could happen to you or I. Which is why Jesus reminds us time and time again, remember, don't forget I chose you first uh, to do these things. Uh, the weekend before Resurrection Downtown launched, I uh, had my last chance, I think of this weekend fondly, my last chance to worship at another church. I don't know if you ever get out to spend time <laughs> at, at other churches just to worship. I, I rarely do anymore, and so I had a moment to worship at a neighboring congregation. And when I go to other churches, typically I try to fly beneath the radar. I don't like to be outed. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's your experience, but I like to kind of just go. And so I went and I tried to be inconspicuous. Uh, nobody really knew me in Kansas City at that point, so I felt like I had a pretty good chance of, of just kind of, uh, you know, getting, getting by, uh, experiencing worship somewhere else. And, and so I did. I had a great experience, and I went uh, after worship, uh, nudged by coffee to go to the coffee table. And, and I grabbed a cup of coffee, and I thought maybe I'd just look around, steal some material, and, uh, and, and, and get some ideas. And, and while I was grabbing coffee, uh, looking through their, their, their programming, uh, somebody engaged me. And, uh, and, and they asked me some questions about myself. They said, hey, you know, what's your name? Should have used a different name, but I didn't. I said, Scott. Uh, well, where are you from? I, I live downtown. And, uh, and they said, oh, you live downtown? Well, I got somebody I need you to go and meet. And, and so then I, I lost sight of that person as they went to try and find somebody to, to introduce me to meet. And, and that person left, and that person left only for a little while to come back. And I hadn't gotten out fast enough before they found me. And, 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 and they, they en en captured me and, and engaged me in more conversation. This time, there was a friend, and that friend was probably like a 50-year-old uh, woman. Her name was Bobby Joe, and, and this person then introduced me to Bobby Joe and said, hey, I got this woman that you need to meet. Her name is Bobby Joe. She, she lives right near you on the northeast side. She's a prostitute, and she's running a house, uh, you know, just, just beyond where, where, where you live, and you need to get to know her. Inside, <laughs> as, as I was hearing him unpack this, I'm thinking in my head, why on earth does he think I need to meet this woman? And so I'm panicking internally, and then I look at Bobby Joe, and, and I, I just kind of push past, and I say, hi, Bobby Joe, I, I'm Scott, it's, it's good to meet you. And Bobby Joe immediately uh, corrects this man. I, I, I used to be a prostitute. I live in the Northeast with a bunch of women who also used to be prostitutes. And, and I was interested at that point in her story. And so I invited her uh, to get another cup of coffee away from this man who introduced me to her. <laughs> and, and we did. And, and, and that's when I, I pressed into Bobby Joe's uh, story. Bobby Joe had a chance to share with me uh, some of her story about how she had her first drink at the age of 12. She drank first because her dad was never home and her mom neglected her in favor of prescription pills. She talked about how one day she accepted an invitation from a couple of older boys who took advantage of her, who gave her pills of her own that pushed her to this place of dependency to the point of prostitution. She said, Scott, in my book, you can read that sometimes my introduction gets boiled down to a bunch of horrific facts, like 24 broken bones. 16 rapes that I can remember, not counting the times I spent as a prostitute or imprisoned as a sex slave. Two abortions, one stint of homelessness, sleeping on an asphalt parking lot under a semi-trailer. 
she described that, that place of darkness and despair. And then she talked about this point that she pushed her to this place of powerlessness. Her, her father passed away without her knowing. Two months later, her mom died of, of horrible cancer, complications of her life of prescription medicine. And in that place of despair, grieving this, this opportunity lost, faced with turning back to addiction, she received this small inheritance, which is an addict's nightmare. As she received this gift that she didn't deserve or earn, this inheritance, she said something happened. It's like God was speaking to me, nudging me, empowering me, instilling with her this vision to to buy a house. And so she did. She bought this old nursing home in the northeast part of town. And she bought it with her own money. And as she bought it, she decided with her two hands to refurbish it, to fix it up, to work on it. And so she spent day and night doing all of the repairs, bringing it back up to snuff. And, and as she was doing that, she, she decided uh, that, that she needed to meet her neighbors, to, to, to get to know her, her neighbors, since this was going to be her new life going forward. And so she did. She knocked on the door next door, and, and she began to get to know them, and she began to learn about them. And, and it was a house full of prostitutes. And then she felt nudged to help them. And so she invited them to join her rent-free in the house that she was repairing and restoring. Pretty soon she ran out of room. Fast forward 14 years later, she owns 12 houses. She has 150 people living with her in Christian community in an institution called the Healing House. I want you to see a picture of, of Bobby Joe. This is the woman who, who I met in small talk conversation at a church that I didn't want to go to. I want you to see a picture of the house that she restored with her own two hands in the northeast part of town. I want you to see some of her people that refer to her as Mama Bobby Joe. And the people that she calls her family, uh, the next picture, uh, worship with us every weekend. That's a picture of all of them at the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts where we host our Easter worship services, the premier performance venue in downtown Kansas City that we open to everybody so that they can experience the resurrection of life without admittance. She brings them every year to pose for this picture so they can see the world around them and how God is calling them to transform the world as misfits in mission. Transforming the world, witness, uh, meeting people where they are. It doesn't inquire, it require giant things. It requires these small, simple opportunities to, to see the world as Christ sees it. To live as Christ longs for us to live, the way that he lives for us first. We need to see uh, the way that Jesus sees. Jesus didn't see death. He, he saw opportunities for life. He didn't see darkness. He saw opportunities for, for light. He didn't see difference. He saw one body. Fueled by the one spirit with a variety of unique gifts. He didn't see pain and suffering. He saw redemption and reconciliation. This is what we should see as well. Possibilities surround. They abound us all, all before us. If only we had the eyes to see it so that we would stop with great flexibility, with great compassion to engage, to meet people where they are, whoever it is that they are, because everybody has a story to tell. Everybody has something to offer. Everybody has been created in God's good image to reflect it in such a way that the world could be transformed by the light, by the grace, and by the spirit given to us. What's your story? I know some of us are lifelong Methodists. Some of us are, are newly minted. I don't care what your experience is. I don't care how qualified you are. You weren't always that way. We weren't born Christians. We were born babies. And at some point in time when we were growing, breathing, maturing, 
Somebody talked to us, met us, inspired us, called us, pushed us to this place where our lives changed, witnessed us in such a way that changed the way that we saw the world. That's why we're here. Can you remember how God spoke to you? Who God moved into your life to meet you so that you could become the best version of the person God created you to be? Somebody capable of transforming the world by the grace given to you? Do you still feel the way you did when you changed? When you professed Christ as Lord? When he called you into service? You should. Don't forget. Remember, Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So go and make disciples. I wanted to close with a couple of different stories, but Bishop, I know we're pressed for time. I'm going to... I'm going to end with one more story. <laughs> and, and it's a story that I wanted to end with, uh, largely because it's a story that's transformed uh, my life. So somebody asked me yesterday, uh, did I ever feel like I was going to fail? The answer is yes. I felt like I was going to fail. I had a moment of pause and doubt when I started Resurrection uh, downtown. What could a guy from Detroit without family or without friends or without connections uh, do in a new city? Oh. And, and I, I didn't know what I was going to do and I, I pressed on and as I pressed on I just did the thing that I knew I needed to do, which was to keep making contacts and to keep meeting people and to keep pushing. And, and then I, I, I experienced some success and, and we grew and we purchased a building and, and then we purchased a second building. And, and as all that was happening, this guy came in uh, to meet me. He was a neighbor. Uh, his name was Brian. Uh, he was the CFO of the Kansas City Star that lives right next door to our church. And, he said, uh, Pastor, I wanted to introduce myself to you. And uh, My name's Brian. I, I'd love to just get to know you a little bit. Can you get to know me? Do you have time? And I didn't, but, but I, I did. So I took the time, and I met with him. Uh, we shared some stories, and he told me he was going through some stuff. Would I mind praying for him? And I did. I prayed with him. For the next three years, we met monthly, uh, Brian and I. Uh, as we met monthly, what happened was, was we engaged in conversation just like friends would. We became close friends. Uh, he didn't worship with us, but, but we became friends that were neighbors. And, and uh, halfway through our relationship, you know, about a year and a half ago, uh, he, he asked the question, are you guys looking for property? And uh, <laughs> we'd been looking for property at that point for over 12 months. I said, well, yeah, what do you have in mind? He said, well, we're looking at at, at selling our, our big parking lot in downtown Kansas City. And uh, we have some other offers, but we'd really like to do a neighborhood deal. And uh, would you be interested? I was telling Jim Osher that the other day, and I said, absolutely, we're interested. What, do you, what, what does a neighborhood deal look like? I don't know what this looks like. I'm not equipped for such things. And, and, uh, and so we started this process of working on a neighborhood deal for this big piece of property. It was a really complicated deal. It was really a structured deal, but, but, but we pressed on through it because this relationship was forging the way. Uh, just this past September, we finally inked the purchase and sale agreement on that piece of property after what was 18 months worth of negotiation that was confidential because this wasn't on the market. If it made it to the market, we would have never been able to afford it because this is a prime piece of real estate. And so that meant we had 120 days to perform due diligence, to share the news with our 
church members to put together a capital campaign to, to make sure that we'd have enough money to purchase this and to build what we needed to build on it. And so we, we, we did. 120 days, we raised over $6.5 million. We moved through the entire city planning process. They approved us in zoning in that 120-day uh, period of time. Uh, we were finally cleared just two weeks ago. I put it on Facebook. I couldn't believe it, it happened that, that fast. So now we're cleared to go ahead and begin working on design, development, and construction. We're able to do something that hasn't happened in downtown Kansas City in over 80 years. I, I want you to see the piece of property because I'm so excited about it. It's shaded in that green area. Our church is that little gray building uh, with that little parking lot right beside it. I want you to zoom out if you can so you can see where that piece of property is in relation to the rest of the city. I want us to hold this picture here because when I look at that piece of property, I think there should be anything there but the church. There should be a hotel. There should be mixed-use residential. There should be any sort of commercial kind of building. There shouldn't be a church there. Cities don't have real estate like that, especially in the heart of the city. And yet somehow, God has made a way to do that. God is, is faithful. God says what he means. He means what he says when he promises us, when he assures us. And, and when I look at this picture, that's evidence of it. What would have happened if I didn't make time for that conversation? What would have happened if I gave in to my fear of failure? What would have happened if three bishops from different conferences didn't figure out a way forward to do something new, even as insignificant as it seemed? What would happen if you forgot and never remembered God's love for you? God's call for you. At the heart of this misfit mission is flexibility and compassion. To remember always to stop and to see the possibilities around you abounding before you. To meet people who are filled with God-sized potential. To invite them to become the best versions of the people God created them to be by presenting them the love of God who already loves them in a way that might change them and transform them and propel them into the future that God has for them, that God has for all of us, a future filled with hope. And so I'm thankful to be able to share Resurrection Downtown story. I I'm privileged. I'm humbled. I've done nothing to deserve it, except that God chooses us. He chose me, just like he's choosing you. So go and make disciples for the transformation of the world by sharing your story and by listening and attuning your ears to others as well. Uh, would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the call and for the people and for the conversations as small and insignificant as they are that have pushed us, that have changed us and transformed us. God, fill us with your spirit. Propel us into the future. Equip us with hearts and minds that believe, that remember, that never forget, that we have the capacity to do the things that you do, even greater things. That by the grace you give us, we can accomplish abundantly far more than anything we could ever think to ask for or imagine. And God, with that love, that casts out all fear, go with us as we transform the world around us one small insignificant conversation at a time in jesus name amen